Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. And sometimes what I find most interesting is as much as I'm an advocate and as much as I'm knowledgeable about all of my illnesses, sometimes I find them making me look out for things that I hadn't even thought about. Welcome to the Asthma Podcast a podcast that shares the real stories of people living with asthma. I'm Sarah Shaw, Senior Manager of BIPOC Community Outreach at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. In this edition of the Asthma Podcast, we will dive into the stories of LGBTQ plus asthma patients within the theme of love should take your breath away, not asthma, exploring how LGBTQ plus individuals navigate identities, relationships, and asthma all at the same time. By sharing these stories, we hope that you feel inspired, heard, and more empowered through you or your loved one's asthma care journey. As a member of the LGBTQ plus community, this topic is very important to me. Why the focus on this community, you ask? Well, a 2018 report by the Human Rights Campaign Foundation found that 21% of the adult LGBTQ plus population in the United States had asthma compared to 14% of the non-LGBTQ plus adult population. In today's episode, we'll hear from Carly, an asthma patient and the chief research and innovation officer and co-host of Lupus Chat. Carly's perspective as a person living with multiple conditions offers unique insight into her experiences living with asthma. Let's dive into her story. Hi everybody, I'm Carly. I live with asthma and other chronic illnesses. I am the Chief Research and Innovation Officer for Lupus Chat. I am also a member of the NIH's COVID-19 Treatment Guidelines Panel, as well as a Research Lead and Liaison with the COVID-19 Global Rheumatology Alliance. Hello, Carly, and welcome to the Asthma Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Well, first, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm doing well. It's been a okay day. <laughs> <laughs> that you know what? We'll take okay, right? Take each day one yeah. step at a time. That's that. That's that's all we can hope for when we live with chronic illness. So, since we're talking about um, asthma, I want to jump into talking to you about like what your earliest experience or memory you have of asthma is or was? My earliest experience is not the same as my earliest memory. So I was actually born with asthma, but I guess the earliest experience I had with it was during labor. My mother had an asthma attack. And so that kind of, you know, propelled things forward. Um, But yeah, yeah. But my earliest memory would have to be, I was fairly young, I probably about six, and um, I had an asthma attack. And so that was like the one thing I remember. Uh, I was at school and going through, you know, the, the motions of, you know, I can't breathe. We were in gym. And so it was, uh, or PE for some people, but um, we had just finished um, some sort of activity and we were sitting down and I couldn't catch my breath the way that normally I would be mm-hmm. able to. And, you know, something wasn't right, obviously. And uh, it kind of went on from there. Uh, you know, trouble breathing, people kind of coming and asking me, am I all right? And wheezing and that type of thing. That must have been pretty scary for you at such a young age to, you know, be struggling to find breath and, you know, your peers coming around you asking you if if you're okay. Do you remember what you were feeling at that time? For me, it's hard for me to remember, you know, anything as young as six years old, but do you remember what thoughts were maybe going through your head? I was embarrassed. (laughs) I was I was embarrassed because it was like this thing is drawing attention to me what's happening you know and that was like I said the first memory I have of it and I'm I don't believe I had an asthma attack prior to then mm-hmm. so you know it was a new experience for me but I had at that time seen others who have had an asthma attack so I I knew what was happening but you know I didn't necessarily know how to handle it from the first person. Right, right. You mentioned your mom actually had an asthma attack while she was in labor with you because of the fact that 
she has this, has a history of asthma. Was that something that she had kind of prepared you for so that you knew what you were experiencing was an asthma attack when you had it? Or were you kind of caught off guard? I was caught off guard for me to have an asthma attack, even though I knew I had asthma. She didn't necessarily prepare me, but she had already told me the story of her having an asthma attack. Um, it was kind of a, a wonky day when she went into labor. So it it's like a funny story associated with it. Well, probably not funny to her as she was the one going through it. <laughs> um, but, you know, now, of course, years later, and even then, um, you know, she could laugh about it, essentially. But I always remembered the story that she told me. And so I knew I had asthma. So it wasn't a surprise on that front. However, that I was actually having an asthma attack was a surprise. I feel like when you're experiencing something for the very first time, nothing can really prepare you. Um, even, you know, even if you have all the tools, you're never going to really know exactly what it feels like. I, I myself do not live with asthma, but I live with other chronic illnesses. And people would tell me what a migraine attack felt like. I The very first time I had one was not what I was expecting. So I was very caught off guard. So right. thank you for sharing that. So into a little fun theme. So the theme of the campaign that, that we're doing is called Love Should Take Your Breath Away, Not Asthma. And I wanted to ask you, <laughs> what does that mean to you? You know, love and falling in love. Well, as of late, I guess my, and I say late, but I guess in recent years, my understanding and experience of love has been different. And so to me, love is a very intentional thing. It is a, it, it is an action word. It's a verb to me. So as much as it is a feeling and, you know, an emotion, it is also something that we do. It's something that's set with intention. It's something that we live, it's something that we act out. And so that means uh, because it is, yes, an emotion, but also, you know, something that we do, we can experience it in a number of ways. And that's not to just, you know, be speaking of romantic love, mm -hmm. but just in general, all forms of love. Absolutely, all forms of love. Speaking of all forms of love, does asthma ever get in the way of you loving or being loved by, you know, family, friends, caregivers, support? Does it ever interfere? It doesn't interfere because where I am on my chronic illness journey, I am to the point where I kind of take precaution prior to something. And I'm always thinking heavily about any activity or event I'm going to do because of my other illnesses. And so asthma is also included in that. And so I'm I'm just ever mindful. That's good. It's kind of like you have the things in your toolkit to prepare yourself. When you wake up every morning, you get out of bed and you're like, okay, this is how I'm going to go through the day knowing X, Y, and Z. To Correct. Kind of like you're saying to, because you've already been living with multiple chronic illnesses, you know, ahead of time. But what was it maybe like before you had the hindsight mm -hmm. of living with uh, with chronic illnesses? Oh, it was absolutely something that happened to me. Not something that I was uh, mindful of or intentional about circumventing. It was just something that happened. There was no plan. There was nothing was in place. It was like, okay, I know I have this thing. That's it. <laughs> you know, that, that was, it was like, I know I have it and whatever happens, happens. Because I guess at that point I hadn't really, outside of having an inhaler and knowing, okay, if you're having an attack, you know, you, you take the inhaler, the rescue inhaler. However, outside of that, it was like, I, I didn't know that it wasn't just a surprise thing. Mm. You know, because that was my experience. Like I said, that first time that I had, it was a surprise. And so I thought it was something that you couldn't plan for. Mm -hmm. You couldn't, you know, try and prevent or take steps to um, alleviate some symptoms, et cetera. Right, right. So y you didn't realize there were plans that you could put into place, kind of like what you were saying earlier. Right. And I think with my age, that wasn't even anything I was thinking about. You know, um, I, I didn't get diagnosed with other uh, chronic illnesses until adulthood. Mm -hmm. Even though I did experience symptoms before, I, the diagnosis didn't come until then. And so it wasn't even on my mind to be trying to prevent something. You know, I, I kind of thought that, you know, okay, if it happens, it happens. 
I have an inhaler. Hopefully I'll remember to bring it with me, you know, that type of thing. Right. Speaking of, you know, rescue meds and things that can help, did you know of any other people that lived with asthma growing up, maybe inside your family, outside of your family? Was this something that that was discussed about how to how to prepare? Like how how did you get to the point where you knew how to figure out how to prepare for these asthma attacks? So I did know people that had asthma and it always seemed as if theirs was worse than mine because they would have frequent attacks. And so it was something that, like I said, I did not even fathom that I had to worry about in that capacity. I just thought, you know, like I said, hey, hopefully I remember my inhaler, you know, that type of thing. It wasn't something that I was really planning for. And I didn't begin looking at my health in that way until I was diagnosed with my other chronic illnesses because, um, you know, the flares were daily and and, in a different capacity and they actually impacted each other. Once I learned those things, that's when, you know, I was able to take uh, better care of myself in that way. Right, right. So it sounds like you kind of learned by trial and error of figuring out what worked and what didn't work. Uh, If we could fast forward to, you know, where you are now, your relationship with, you know, your loved ones, how do you and your partner plan for your asthma attacks? Like, are are there certain special things that they do to help? It's kind of awkward, too, when you're in a relationship or you're telling people that maybe don't know about a chronic condition, you know, okay, hey, here's something that is part of my life and here's how I deal with it and here's how you can deal with it. Like, are these conversations that you had to have? When it came to my other chronic illnesses, those were the conversations I had foremost. And funny enough, my partner found out I had asthma kind of happenstance. You know, she heard me mentioning it to someone um, and was like, oh, I didn't know you had asthma. And I was like, wait, I thought I told you that, you know. Did you have to have those conversations with your partner? Or was that something kind of like you said that was unspoken that they already knew? I, I think because they, uh, because she also knew someone, uh, you know, knew others with asthma, the what to do uh, is kind of unspoken. However, now if she hears me wheezing, you know, she, she pays closer attention and things like that. And, you know, she just ensures that if we're doing high energy activity or something that would be extreme cardio or, or something of that sort, it, that I'm, I'm pacing myself and I'm, I'm being more careful because I, I like to take ownership of my illness and I'm kind of a control freak about it. Um, and not letting others help me, that whole thing. And so she just makes sure that I am using my tools effectively. And, you know, that's her way of helping. It's so common when we live with uh, chronic illnesses that we often think that we have to do things alone and we don't need help or we're so used to navigating the world by ourselves. And it's so wonderful when you have partners and family members and caregivers or care partners that help that step in and like help remind you not to overdo it or not to um, right. uh, just be like, okay, like, you know, how about we, you know, we, we avoid this trigger or, you know, are, are you sure you're okay? Or if they're there to like hand you uh, your, your rescue medication. I know my, my partner, she does that for me a lot with my chronic illness. And so I think that it's, Asthma, chronic illness, like they're a a multi-person disease at times where you have to let the person that you love and the one that supports you know what's going on so that they know how to help, help you help yourself, right? Absolutely. And that's something that is very new for me. And that's not to say that I didn't have a partner before who knew about my illnesses. I didn't have a partner who knew and cared in this way. And when you have that and you're not used to it, it comes as a shock and it it seems very weird. But one of the things that we hold steady to is, um, because I had a a habit of holding information, you know, Um, like if I went to an appointment, not necessarily telling everything as to not worry her. And so we have an agreement now that I will not do that. You know, I will be completely honest when it comes to my health. And it's for that reason. It's for the reason of if something happens, you know, she'd be able to maneuver properly to help me. And then also it's, uh, she told me something one time that really just blew me out the water and it shouldn't have, but it did. And she was just like, you know, you're not responsible for other people's worry. 
Mm. Especially when the thing that they're worrying about is something that negatively impacts you. You're not responsible for that. You worry about the thing and you let them worry about their worry. That's that's really And powerful. I was like, whoa. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I have to maneuver with that in mind. And if this is going to be a partnership that, you know, I had to relinquish control in that way. I had to let go of just being the only person, you know, uh, active in my care. Absolutely. It's kind of like when you can shoulder the burden with somebody else, it makes it, it's, it's scary at first, right? Like you're like, wait, no, what are it is, but it makes it easier. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm so glad that you have that support system. You have that loving, caring partner that wants to help you in your journey. And I think that people can learn a lot about relationships like that, where you're able to have somebody supportive in your life that takes an interest in your health, takes an interest in your journey, and is there to like be a teammate really to help navigate um, all of that. And I hope that for everybody, honestly, that that's something that everybody will have. For sure. Speaking of, you know, supportive partners and communities, being part of the LGBTQ plus community, have you found that that community has supported you in your asthma journey or are there other communities that have supported you in your, in your asthma journey? I would say indirectly, the LGBTQ plus community has supported me. And the reason I say indirectly is because my friends have supported me. And they are themselves queer. And, you know, so when we would be going to queer spaces or whatever, you know, they they make sure I have everything I need when we're going out or, you know, we're doing things. And so in that way, uh, they've helped me. But it hasn't really been, you know, a, a focal point, so to speak. We didn't make it a spectacle. But my friends have done over the years the thing where that they're supposed to do. You know, they're there for me in whatever way I need them. And that does include ensuring that I'm most prepared for if something should go wrong. That's really, really good. Really amazing that you have that support system, that people that look out for you. I know that too in the chronic illness community that along with friends, there's also other people that get it. Like I know that you have a support system within Lupus Chat. Do you want to talk a little bit about how they've supported you? Oh, 100%. And it's twofold because not only is it Lupus Chat, the community, you know, of patients and caregivers, but it's also the executive team. As I am a member of the executive team, the other three people are three of my closest friends. And it's because of how we take care with each other in that way. You know, two of which are patients themselves, one is a caregiver. And so uh, we are there for each other in that way. And they have been extremely supportive uh, when it comes to any any illness that I have. Um, and the same goes for Lupus Chat, the community, because I have the ability to, you know, not only ask them questions about, you know, their experiences with lupus, but also with uh, any other chronic illness or or condition that they may have. It's been extremely helpful. And, you know, it's one of those things where it's always good not to have to explain it to people who already get it. That's like a second layer of comfort. And so that's something that I get to, I'm, I'm lucky to experience. It's like that unspoken, uh, you know, language that we all kind of speak. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's really, truly amazing where you don't have to explain away, oh, I'm doing this because of X, Y, and Z, or I need to sit down because, you know, I have, to, I walked up these steps and they just get it. They just understand. They get it. Yeah. And sometimes uh, what I, what I find most interesting is as much as I'm an advocate and as much as I'm knowledgeable about all of my illnesses, sometimes I find them making me look out for things that I hadn't even thought about. And I'm like, oh yeah, I should probably pay attention to that, <laughs> you know, that type of thing. So that's helpful as well. Yeah, I absolutely. I absolutely agree. I think what maybe the audience would like to know is what advice do you have to share for somebody that is maybe just starting out on their asthma journey, maybe somebody that's new and is scared and trying to navigate this new um, chronic illness. What what advice do you have to share from the things that you've learned on your journey to other people? 
I would say first and foremost, pay attention to your body. Uh, Listen to what it's telling you and be mindful about the activities that you do and when and, and the environment because there are so many different things that can trigger you. You have to just make sure you're doing everything you do with intention. And I know it can feel cumbersome at times. Like, oh, why do I have to think about this? Why do, Why can't I just be quote unquote normal? But it's in your best interest because number one, you need to breathe. That is, uh, you know, something that we all need. Um, but as we are also now navigating pandemics with an S, um, <laughs> but um, just thinking about COVID, and things like that, that, that complicates things. You know, I can speak from experience as how that has also impacted my asthma and, and my experience with that. And so just being super mindful, paying attention to your body, being honest with your loved ones. Like I said, that was one of the most important lessons that I've learned in recent years was to, to let go of the control, be honest. And that's even when you're going through your acceptance process with, you know, your, your disease, with your illness, because there are, you know, there are people, oh yeah, they say I have asthma, but I don't, I haven't had an asthma attack or, you know, and you're, you're just kind of glib about it until you can't be. And so I think it's important to be honest with yourself, be honest with others so that they can help you as you kind of navigate your journey with this and and understand that it's a journey. What your asthma looks like now may not be the same that it's going to look like in some years to come. And so it's important to document those things. It's important to also be honest with your physician and, you know, have open communication with your entire healthcare team. But also you want to be letting your uh, employer know certain things as much as you can without, you know, uh, that you feel comfortable with, but just enough so that, you know, should something happen, they're able to help you. You just drop so many nuggets of wisdom that I think anybody just starting out on their journey can really appreciate and take to heart is, you know, it's like I mentioned, it's probably really scary when you are diagnosed with something new or you're experiencing something new and you don't really know where to turn, what to do. And I think that you really shared a really authentic way to navigate and empower yourself to do what's best for yourself um, to get you to better treatment and better care. So I want to thank you. Thank you, Carly, for joining us today, sharing your nuggets of wisdom. I know that I appreciate it. I know that our listeners will really appreciate that. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me and for uh, having this space and, you know, creating the time for this. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to this special episode of the Asthma Podcast, where you hear about the stories of LGBTQ plus asthma patients. We touch on navigating love, relationships, and their health. If you like this episode, please give it an honest five-star rating and subscribe. Once again, I'm Sarah Shaw, and I will see you next time. This episode of the Asthma Podcast was made possible with support from Amgen and AstraZeneca, sponsors of the Global Healthy Living Foundation. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network.